Hello and welcome to this new video about developing in C++ on RISCOS using Acorn and now Roll DD desktop development environment C++. A C++ compiler based on the old AT&T Cfront and this particular one predates Cfront 3.1. Quick update. Uh, in this video, we are going to use the new at the time of recording this video release of DD 31C, which uh, has just come out. And big news the uh, role team has fixed all the issues with um, DDT, the desktop debugger, that we have seen on the previous video. So, pretty cool stuff. Okay, so um, if you have tried the uh, debugging session on the previous video, you probably have noticed that something was quite not right when you've tried to uh, enter your own um, methods, your own class methods. Let's have a look at what I mean by that. So here I have the code that we presented on the previous video, right? And I already compiled it. Um, for debugging. So as soon as I double click on this one, it will be opened uh, immediately in DDT. Now, uh, make sure that before you double click on uh, this, you obviously have um, set the path from the Acorn um, C and C++ development environment. Okay, so let's double click on it. And there we have it. Let's just put the windows in a better position that's the way i normally use ddt all right so the first thing we're going to do is click continue and that will bring us immediately at the uh, main then we're going to set a breakpoint at uh, line 90 where we actually uh, instantiate our object so we're going to click again continue and that will stop at the breakpoints it's a quick way to skip some of the initializations there you go we are there okay next we are going to do a single step in and we will try to get into get instance okay and if we do that you will notice you know disappointment <laughs> It will not allow us to uh, enter get instance uh, with a debugger and we will just move to the next line now this is problematic because obviously when we debug we want to make sure that we can debug our own methods and functions okay but do not despair there is actually a way to solve this problem and it is just in the way we write our C++ so what are these issues? Well, let's have a look at our source code. And basically the problem is in the way we have declared and defined our cap singleton uh, class. In the original code, what we've done is we've created a class. Obviously we have declared all the uh, private and public uh, methods but we also have defined them inside the class now this is a perfectly valid c++ syntax however uh, ddt the debugger has difficulties to actually find the methods when we use this type of uh, syntax so to avoid the problem we actually have to um, write the code in a different uh, way which is still a perfectly valid C++, and we're going to have a look at it right now. So here we have the uh, new version of Play with Caps Lock, which has the correct syntax for helping us to debug the code with DTT. So um, you will find all this code in all the code of this video in our uh, Git repository on GitHub risk cost community on github uh, link in the video description below all right so let's have a look at the source code so the first thing we had to do uh, to help ddt debugger 
uh, is that we had to move our class uh, declaration into one header file and so I created the H directory and I added a header file called CL class. The um, file, the other file has a, a header here that checks if we are including um, this file within a C compiling session. And if so, it will um, return an error because obviously C++ cannot be compiled by a C compiler, so it can only be compiled when we are compiling through um, a C++ compiler. And then we have our uh, barrier here, and then we have the class declaration. If you remember, we have created a class called cap singleton, and what we're doing here, we are only declaring the class. We're not defining any methods. As you can see, we have here our constructor, we have our public uh, methods here, but we are not uh, defining them. We're just declaring them. And that's what we're doing in this header file. So we're just declaring the class with this private and public members, basically. That's all. Okay. Then we have our C++ directory that now contains two files. The original flash caps lock, which now contains only the main function, and we're going to have a look at it in a minute, and then a new file called CL class. And CL class is where we implement all the methods that we have declared in the class header file. So here we have our constructor, and the syntax that we use to um, define them is we put the name of the class, colon, colon, and then the name of the method. So as you can see, this works also for private methods. Okay, so all good. And the code, it's the same, so I'm not going to describe the code. The same here, uh, we have done for get instance. Okay, so we have the return, then we have the class name, colon, colon, then we have get instance. And the same here, the return um, type, which is void, and then we have the class name, and then we have colon, colon, then print and so on and so forth for all the other methods, okay? Now, the other important thing that this uh, file does, it will include the class header. So the compiler, when we are defining all this method, is aware that there is a class declared as cap singleton, okay? That's very important. Otherwise, you will get an error. All right. And then this is our uh, flash. Uh, caps lock original file in which we have removed everything it will only include the uh, class header and because we're including the class header here and also in the CL class file okay then we put a barrier in it because obviously there are going to be two uh, files trying to include it so we only need one instance of the class and that's and that's it so then we have our uh, setting of instant PTR to null as before. And then we have our main here that is identical as it was uh, before. No changes whatsoever. Okay. So the last bit of change we have done is into obviously into the make file. And we have added CL class to the list of objects that we want to uh, use to create the component uh, flash caps lock. If you still don't understand the shared make files from roll, don't worry, we're going to have a video uh, just about them. But they are basically make files that are much easier to use in compared to having to write a make file from um, the ground up. All right, so this is the other change that we did here. And that's it, that's all. Okay, so now let's have a look. I already built the um, debuggable executable here. So I'm going to double click on it and we will open it in uh, DDT. And there we go. Let's just set the windows as I normally use them. You don't have to do this, but that's just me. I like it this way. All right. So first thing we do is continue and we get into our entry point in main, then we set our breakpoint uh, where 
we are going to instantiate our uh, my caps lock one object this time is at line 23 because we have removed the class remember from the flash cap, uh, caps lock file all right so we press continue again and there you go we are ready to now check if we can get into get instance this time so we open the single step window and we are going to uh, click step by source statement and step into procedure uh, just one step and let's see what happened and boom automatically this time it works and we are into uh, get instance okay so now we can keep going we can also set breakpoints in um, our methods like this like so and we can keep going and we can have a regular debugging session okay now what we're going to do next is we're going to have a look at a piece of code that i specifically have written to learn a bit more debugging techniques uh c++ debugging techniques using ddt okay okay so let's have a look at this new code example first of all we are going to have a look at what the class header file that we have in h and this this case we call it uh, some class so um, again we have in um, the way to detect if we are uh, if somebody's using this file in a C compiler and if so it will return an error then uh, we have a pragma that um, basically tell the compiler to put this uh, source code included at the top level and then we have our barrier which avoid um, when we have multiple files including this header to have multiple copies of the same header in the uh, complete source um, okay next we have the declaration of some class and we in the private area we have put a bunch of private variables what we want to do in this uh, code example is to show how we can actually debug uh, our uh, code when it uses a lot of private variables and how can we track them and how can we access them. That's because DDT is not able to access them directly while they are private. So we need to use some technique in order to make sure that we always know when something in our code is modifying them and what is actually doing with them. Okay. And then we, in our public um, section, we have put our constructor, we have put our destructor, and then we have a bunch of public methods that we are going to use to uh, print the value contained in the variables, uh, the address, that's just to check if our technique is going to be basically correct. You don't need to add this stuff in your real world uh, code. The technique that I'm going to show you uh, is more than sufficient. You don't need to add extra debugging code. And then we're going to have a method that just increments the index variable. A method that changes the string pointed by the uh, message, which is HR pointer. Right. And then we have a method that is going to change the status. We are going to have a look at all the details here in the implementation file. Okay. So just to remember, we have a private um, member variable that is an index, just a generic index. Then we have a, a private member variable that is a pointer to a string, pointer to a message. Then we have an integer private variable that represents the length of the message. And then we finally have another integer variable that represents a generic status, which is going to be a bunch of bits that we're going to set um, and so on and so forth. Okay. All right. Next, we're going to have a look at the implementation file. So we have a sum class file, which is only the uh, basically implementation of all the methods uh, that we have declared in the class header file and again it includes the uh, class header file and then we uh, define each method uh, 
uh, with the syntax that we've seen before. So name of the class, colon, colon, and then name of the method. In this case, we have a constructor. So let's have a look at what the constructor does. Well, what the constructor does is sets index to one. That's just a generic way. It sets a message len through uh, 13. In this case, 13 bytes. Then this is more important. It allocate memory for the uh, message using malloc and it allocates enough memory that uh, is for the message length. And then what we're going to do next, we're going to call change message and we are going to insert hello world plus the not terminator in message. Okay. And then the last bit we do here is we set status to zero. Next, we're going to have a look at the destructor. This is how we define the um, destructor, right? So um, name of the class, colon, colon, the destructor symbol, and then remember to put a space, that's important, and then the name of the destructor, which is again the name of the class. All right, so now what the destructor does, well, here I reset those index and status variable, okay? And that is just to show you that our techniques will be able to capture anything that is happening to our variables, even when the destructor is being called, okay? So it's pretty useful. And then we have the important part of the destructor, right? Which is the C++ RAII um, feature, which basically is that because C++ will always call a destructor when an object gets out of scope, then we can free the resources allocated for that object in the destructor. And that is a big important feature offered by C++ over C. In C, if you come from C, you remember that when you are allocating stuff, then you have to free it, right? However, it's kind of complicated to free it if you start having, you know, multiple if uh, structures or calling other functions and whatever. It's very easy to lose track of what actually has to be done. And especially when you have a lot of condition that you may return from a function that allocated that amount of memory and uh, you have the free at the end of your function, but the uh, uh, there is some kind of side effect of a condition that actually makes you exit before actually you can free. So that's a typical problem that you will have when you code in C. But you can solve that problem very easily in C++ by doing what? Well, freeing everything into the destructor. The destructor, when your object will get out of scope, will always be called. And so this is one of the big features that C++ offer um, over C. It's called RAII. The acronym is horrible. I'm not going to even pronounce it. I don't like it. But that's how the C++ community calls it. <laughs> and so I just prefer the um, little, the short form. All right. So next we are going to have a look at our public uh, method print values, which, well, as the name says, is going to print the value contains in our private uh, variable. So it's going to print the value in index, it's going to print the value message, it's going to print the uh, value in message len and the status. Okay. And then the next one is going to be print other, and that will print the address in memory that we have of our uh, private members. Now, you don't need to, again, you don't need to do that. We're going to do that. We're going to do this, sorry, just to prove that our technique works. Um, important thing, when an object is instantiated within a function, so in a, in a, in a code block, normally it's instantiated on the stack. So it's going to be interesting to play with these values. However, remember that we have message here that is being uh, assigned a chunk of memory that is on the heap. So uh, it's going to be very interesting. Okay. Next, we're going to have a look at the ink index, which, well, as mentioned, it just increment the index. And then a, bit, a slightly more interesting function is change message, which takes a pointer to a string that is both const const. And what it does is, the first thing it does is check if the length of the new string is uh, bigger than the length that we have already in our uh, message. And if it is, then it will set the length of our message buffer 
to the new uh, string length and then it will call realloc to uh, extend the size of memory that has been assigned to message. Now, during the debug, this is going to be very interesting to look at what's actually going to happen when we call realloc, okay? And if the new string is not uh, bigger than the actual, then we will not take the if and we will just go to the next statement, which is a str and CPI, which is a C function that will copy uh, stir into message and we do it in a safe way because we use the length of message and not the length of stir and then the final bit that we do to be absolutely safe is we create a pointer okay msg and which points where at the end of message okay and what we do here is that at the end of message, we will always put a null terminator. Now, this is because sometimes we, I don't know, we may uh, copy, we may forget to copy the null terminator or maybe whatever reason. So we want to be sure that before we return our message here, we'll always contain a null terminator at the very end of his buff. Okay. All right. Let's see the last one which is change status. Now, change status, what it does, it takes a new status, which is an integer variable. So, you know, integer variable can be considered also uh, bit flags, basically. And so if um, the bit flags is, um, if, if, the, if the number contains a new status is basically bigger than minus one, so it's either zero or a positive number, then we will uh, uh, change the status with the new status. Otherwise, we will ignore it. Now, this is just to do something, okay? All right, so that's it. This is what we're doing. The, thing, the final thing we're going to have a look at is main. And so main is our main function. And again, main also includes the uh, some class header. And that is because obviously main has to instantiate the object. So it needs to, it needs to be aware of the class. And what main does? Well, main will call some function. Well, literally, <laughs> some function. And the first time we're going to pass a value of one. And then when we will return from some function, we will call some function again. And this time we're going to pass the value two and then we quit. Now let's have a look at some function and how some function works. Well, uh, some function will first print on the screen that we are about to create an instance of, well, some class. And here is where we create the instance of some class that is going to be some object. And OK, so if we have passed here, you know, uh, one, we will not take this if statement. But if we have passed two, we will take this if statement. So what's going to happen is that immediately after we created some object, we will try to alter is default values that will be set here through the constructor that we have seen just one minute ago. OK. So if test is one, we will leave basically the default values. And if test is equal to two, we will modify, we will try to alter the default values. And then what we do after that is we're going to print those values, uh, values that are contained in some object, and then we're going to print the address of our private uh, member variables. Okay. And that's what we're going to do. Okay. What we're going to do next is we're going to see this in action. I already have compiled it ready to uh, be debugged. OK, so we started the debug session. I already organized the windows uh, as I like it. So the next thing we're going to do is click on continue. And that will bring us at the uh, entry point of the main function. We are going to put a breakpoint at here, some function. I'm going to press continue. This makes it quick and avoid to see all the step of the initialization. All right, so let's get into some function. And there we are. So the first thing we're going to do is going to print a message on the screen. And yes, it's creating some classes. It's instantiating some class. Now, we are here where we are about to create some object. Now, this is a very important place. So here you have to stop. Okay. And what we're going to do next here, we're going to go on the status window 
and we're going to press the menu. We're going to go on the option display, okay, and we're going to click on locals. And what this is going to do, sure, it's going to show us like the local variable like test, and in this case, we have called some function uh, passing the value one, so test is equal to one. Now, the important thing, however, to notice is some object. And what he shows us, it shows us that, well, we all know that an object and a class are struct, right? But in this particular case, it's useful because it shows us the struct that contains all the private members, okay? And this shows us how the private members are ordered, okay, in this struct. So we have index, then we have message, then follow msg len, and then the last one is status. Remember the order that is important. All right, so we know the struct and we know all the private members and their order. Now, here is showing the value that is being temporarily assigned to them, and that all these are all crazy values. We still have to create our object, but that's another good reason to remember always to um, initialize the values of all your variables, because C and C++ are not reliable, and they may not initialize it correctly, and that may cause troubles. Okay, so that for beginners, you see why you have to initialize always your values. Okay, so let's step into um, the constructor of... Uh, some class and here we are now we are at the entry point so we're going to move one more step down and here we are so what we're going to do next again menu display and we're going to have we're going to request for locals now what's going to happen now is that he's going to display this i mean literally this <laughs> which is the pointer to uh, memory where our object is being created. And this pointer is very important because you remember that an object is fundamentally a struct, an instance of a struct. You have seen the struct above here, and now you have the address. And this address actually corresponds to what? To the first member of the struct, which is index. So we cannot access index. So if we want to set, for example, a watch point on index, that will give us an error because it's a private member. But what we can do instead, we can actually set a watch point to this memory address. Let's do that. So menu, we're going to go watch point, and we're going to set this memory address, 105F0. And then we say set the watch point on memory. And that works. Okay, so he's happy. Okay, well, that's well and good, but then, how, you know, <laughs> where are message, MSG, land, and status? We only have the address of index. Well, they actually follow. And that's because this struct actually is a struct of pointers to the memory that contains the data for those variables. And therefore, the next available memory address here is will point to... Uh, in this case, to where message will store the um, pointer to the memory that it will use uh, to have a string. Okay, so we uh, are making an hypothesis here, right? So we'll have to prove that. So next, what we're going to do is we're going to set a watch point to what follows in memory. We are on a 32-bit architecture, so the next address that we can use is going to be 105F4 every four byte. However, now in this case it's simple, <laughs> so the math is very simple. But if you have difficulties with hexadecimal uh, calculation, um, what you can, what you normally do is, well, it's a desktop, so I would load a calculator and make it do it for me. In this case, you can't because the debugger is semi multitasking, if you remember from my article where I actually describe how DDT actually work. So unless you have a different computer next to you, this is going to be a bit complicated. But what you can do in DDT in this case, you can express the next memory address as an expression. So let's do that. We're going to say the base address, which is 105F0 plus, and then we're going to pass the value, the, inc the increment 
uh, for the next memory address that we want to check. And in this case, we're going to pass it hexadecimal. So we're going to type enter cent and the number four. And this is the address where we want to set the next watch point. And again, we press on memory. Okay, this should be for message. Well, what about MSG LAN? Well, let's do this. MSG LAN should be located after message. So in this case, it's going to be 105F0 plus hexadecimal 8. All right. Okay. And we have one more to go, which is status. Okay, so if our calculation, our, our hypothesis is correct, well, status uh, uh, point it should be uh, at F0 plus 12. Now, 12 in X decimal is C. So what we're going to do here is going to be 105 F0 plus and percent C. Okay. And there you have it. We have created four watch point. We had four private members and we have created four watch point. Now let's check if our hypothesis is correct. So what we're going to do next, we're going to do a step by source statement, okay, which will execute this and we will see if our watch point is capable of detecting that we have assigned one to index. Let's find out. So press OK and boom. Yes, it is able to do exactly that. And it, basically the watch point is saying, hey, somebody has changed the value at this memory address and the new value is one. Now, don't get fooled. The values that is showing, they're going to be in hexadecimal. Of course, one is the same in decimal and hexadecimal. But for the next value, keep in mind that they're going to be expressed in hexadecimal. All right. So we know that index is, is correct. Now let's find out if message line is also correct. Well, let's press OK again. And boom. Yes, also MSG LAN is correct. And the new content, and here you can see is D, well, it's not D, the letter is X decimal, which is 13 in decimal, okay? All right, now let's check what happened uh, for message. Let's see if we also have got message correctly. So we execute the malloc and boom again. Yes, it is also message correct. Now, in this case, this is a very important information. This number here is actually the memory address on the heap where malloc has allocated the memory for our message buffer. Again, of 13 bytes, right? And where we are going to store the message hello world when we will execute change message. So let's have a look at this memory address, how it is right now, what's going on in there. So what to do that, what we're going to do is click the menu display, and then we're going to type this memory address, 1283C, and then we're going to click memory. And now up here, we have a different content. We moved from the source code to an actual output that reminds a little bit the typical output of very old debuggers, where you have the memory address and then the next four, in this case, on RISCOS, four words. Uh, if you come from Windows uh, background, these are double words for you. Uh, and so we are going to have one, two, eight, three, okay zero but we need to reach c and c i'm going to tell you is the last one normally this is zero this is four this is eight and this is c okay just for your convenience remember always that all right so well we see that there is nothing in there and it's a typical um reservation that uh, happened with with i think dd so let's do another step in and let's see what happened. We will now jump into change message. Okay. And okay, we are into change message. And so we know that we are going, we are about to write hello world. So we're going to check the length of hello world. Is it bigger than the actual buffer site? No, it isn't. And so we will ignore the if statement. We won't take it and we will go straight to the stir MCPI which will copy hello world into message. 
Well, let's do exactly that. And next, what we're going to do is we're going to check again that memory address, which is still here. So all we need to do is click again on memory. And there you have it. Hello world. Now, at this point, we need to do we need to pay a little bit of attention, especially if you are a beginner with this, okay? You need to understand how this string is actually written in memory. So, well, the string starts here. As you remember, this is 1283C, okay? All right. Next, well, you might be tempted, okay, from here and probably goes down here. Well, no. 48 is the hexadecimal uh, code for the ASCII letter H, capital H, okay? Hexadecimal code, not decimal. Then where the E here is stored is actually here, okay? And 65 is the hexadecimal code for the letter small e. And when the double L is written is here, 6C and 6C, okay? They are here. So this is literally the word L, which <laughs> is not a particularly funny word, but yeah, that's pretty much it. Okay, so where is the O then? Well, the O is written here at 12840, okay? This is... 12840, this is 12841, this is 12842, and this is 12843, and this is 12844, 45, 46, 47, and this is 48. Okay. All right, so the O is here, and what follows is the space, which is uh, 20, is the hexadecimal for the space, which is here, and then 57 is the hexadecimal for the capital W. And then 6F, well, is the hexadecimal, okay, for the O. We already seen it. It's here. So this is the O here. All right, so the R now is here, 72. All right. And then we have 6C, which you already see. We know it's the L because we already seen it up here. So 6C is the L, so it's here. And then we have 64, which is the D. And then we have 21, which is the hexadecimal for the exclamation point. And then the important part is that on 12848, we have the null terminator, double zero. Okay, we have it here. Null terminator. Okay, so this string is fine. We copied it fine. All right. Good job. Now let's keep going. And what we're going to do next, well, we're going to write... And at, well, we're going to overwrite the null terminator at 48, and that's okay because we said this is to just to make sure that there's always a terminator, even if, in case we may not copy it. So, okay, we're going to do that. Okay, we did it, and if we are going to check this memory location again, we will see that we have added an extra null down here, which corresponds to the very end of our buffer, okay? And we're good. Now we're going to return back to um, our constructor, okay? And we are about to set status to zero. So let's see if the watch point uh, memory address that we provided for the status is also correct. So we are going to execute it and Boom, also 105F0 plus uh, in% C is correct, and we have detected, the watch point has detected that we have written a zero at the memory location pointed by status. Now, it's good that we have found those variables, but remember, you always have to check because it is not insured 100%, okay? All right, as I keep going, now, what we're going to do next, because we remember we have passed, we, the, the first time we're calling some function, we have passed one. So we're going to skip test. And we're going to go and print the values contained in our private um, member variables. Okay, let's have a look. 
and index is one, yay. Message is hello world, great. And message len is 13, and status is zero. Wonderful, okay. Now we're gonna print the address of those. Um, and let's see if we, well, we already know we got them correctly, but let's double check. So the address of index, it's 105F0, as we predicted. The address of message is 105F4, as we predicted, which can also be expressed as 105F0 plus um, hexadecimal 4. The address of msglen is 105F8, as we predicted, and again, it can be expressed as F0 plus uh, hexadecimal 8. And status is 105FC, again, as we predicted, and it can be expressed as uh, F0 plus um, uh, N percent C, okay? All right, now that we've done that, well, we're going to leave some function, and this is where the destructor magic happened. As you can see, we are leaving some functions, so our sum object is now out of scope, and, well, we are calling the destructor. Okay, let's see if he, if when we call the destructor, our uh, watch point are still capable of detecting the changes in our private members correctly. Let's see. And boom, the ad address didn't change, of course. So yes, everything is still um, the watch point is still capable of detecting that the values has changed, and that's very good for debugging purposes. And the same for uh, status. But in this case, you probably noticed it didn't show us. Well, did it fail? No, it's because status was already zero. So that's another important information. Watch point will only tell you when the value change. But if the value is written and it does, it's the same value, so if the value is actually not changed, then it will not signal it to you. Okay. And now we are going to free message. Okay. And set message to null, and that will be detected because the address, the old address pointed by message, is replaced now by null, which is zero. All right, so we finish the destruction, and now we are going to go back to our main function where we are about to call some function two. Now, this is also going to be very interesting because we going to see how uh, some compiler optimization actually works. Now, because we're calling some function uh, in such a close um, distance, most likely what's going to happen next is that the addresses that we're going to use to create a new sum object are going to be exactly the same as the previous uh, sum object. And that's because the compiler obviously has um, detected that and has optimized the use. But again, it's not guaranteed. So if between these two functions we will have done something else, most likely the address for some object that is going to be created again here in some function will have been different, okay? So don't rely on this. All right, so we're back into some function. Of course, we're going to print something on the screen. There you go, we have printed it, so we're creating some instance. And we're back here at some class, and we're about to create some object. And of course, if we display the logos again, we're going to see the struct again. And the order of the private member is going to be the same. And again, they have some crazy value in it. And that's because we are still, we need to initialize it. Okay. But in this case, we're going to see that test is equal to two. And so this time, when we get to the if here, we will take it. So let's see what happened. All right, so we will now jump into the constructor and okay, so we are here and so let's print the locals and let's see if some object has been instantiated exactly at the same memory address as before. And yes, it has. And that again is because we haven't done anything between calling some function one and calling some function two because these things have been uh, instantiated. So if we would have done something else, uh, probably, you know, the stack would be different or uh, the heap would be different, so on and so forth. In this case, we haven't done anything. So yes, the compiler has reused these same addresses. 
And so obviously, just by doing index equal to one now, the watch point will detect that. So we don't have to input these watch points again. So, uh, and yes, it's detected that we have written one on index. And that's because the address of index has not changed, okay? And then again, for MSG LEN, it will detect it. And again, it's playing D, which is the X decimal for 13. And then message. And also message is getting the same address. And that's because we freed it before and nothing else has been using the heap. So obviously the uh, malloc is going to give us the same address as before. And then we're going to write hello world into it. So we're going to do exactly what we did before. And, and we know already hello world is not uh, bigger than the actual buffer size. So it's not going to enlarge the buffer. And then it's going to copy the message. And one thing that we want to see before we, uh, um, we before we write a new message into it, let's have a look at this memory address. Let's see what's in there now. Well, as you can see, because there's been some work for distanciation, part of the message has been deleted, but part is still there. And that's because this, this portion of the memory has not been touched by anything else. So it's basically just uh, there. Okay. Let's write hello world. And we did. So if we're going to go back there now, we are going to see that our hello world is back in all is glory. All right. And again, 48H, then you have E, L, L. So hell is written basically from uh, <laughs> right to left. And it's hell. Please don't go conspiracy theory here. <laughs> this is just risk cost and the ARM architecture. Anyway, so that's it. So we keep going. And now we are again putting our null terminator in there. And obviously we're going to set status to zero. And it's been detected as well. And again, because all the addresses have not changed. We haven't done anything. But this time test is equal to two. So we're going to take the if. So let's see what happened next. Well, the first thing we're going to call is increment index. And let's see. We're going to catch it. Of course we are, because obviously the address uh, won't change during uh, the uh, instant, you know, when, when after the object has been instantiated. So yes, that's going to be, and it's going to show us that we have a new content that is two. And now we're going to write a new message. And this time we can see that this message is much, it's much bigger than Hello World. So it's definitely going to be interesting. Let's have a look. Okay, we're here, and this time we're going to take the if because we know that the message is longer. All right, so message land now is going to be changed, and probably the watch point will detect that. And yes, indeed it did, and it's going to tell us that it's 2C. Again, this is hexadecimal value that is written in uh, message land. Now, if we're going to have a quick look at this memory... So 105F0, okay. We can also specify in this form, even for, for this, okay, plus eight memory. Now we're gonna see here that we have, okay, 2C, and 2C has been written this time, and not like um, our um, messages. And that because, remember, pointers have a type, and that type is used to actually understand how much in, <laughs> in memory has to be written. So when we uh, just say, I don't know, 13 or, or 40 or 44, uh, for an integer, it will take all the 32 bits, okay? And that's because an integer on RISCOS is, and on ARM32 is 32 bits, okay? However, when we have written the strings, you notice that the strings are being uh, put in there byte by bytes, and it's because the strings are ASCII, the, one, the strings that we are using, and therefore they're using one byte per each letter, okay? And that is important, that's why they are char pointers, okay? And a char is one byte. Right here, we can also see the address that we have for our allocated memory. Okay, so let's keep going. And this time, we are going to have a realloc. So let's see what happened with realloc. Hey, interesting. Now, realloc here, okay, realloc. 
to give us a much larger chunk of memory. Well, has reserved that, but he took the memory in a different address. So we have now 12808. And obviously our watch point has detected that and said, hey, somebody or something has changed the value at the memory address for message. And now we have 12808. So let's have a look at what actually truly happens here. So we are going to first have a look at uh, 1283C, um, if I remember correctly, the old pointers. Okay, in memory. And again, because we have removed it, so you can see that the old error word is kind of being corrupted. That's because we're no longer using it, and so this memory has been already used uh, by something else. And now we're going to have a look at 12808. Okay. And well, so realloc not only gave us a much larger, much larger chunk, excuse me, but it also has copied the previous hello world into it. So our message is still pointing at hello world and just all this is happening on a different memory segment. Okay. Next, you've seen the source code. If we press OK here, what we're going to do, we're going to do a stir and CPI of the new larger string into this new segment. Okay. So we will overwrite hello world with the new string. And let's see how this works. So we just did it. Okay, we just executed tr and CPI. So let's have a look again at the memory address. We're going to go display. The address is here. We're going to click memory. And there you have it. This is a different and much longer message. Full stop. Attention. Can you notice that we have a problem? We have not this time copied the null terminator of the previous string. So of this is blah, blah, blah. So, well, our check that is happening now is going to save our <laughs> day and we are going to add the null terminator. OK, so let's do that. We're going to press OK. And we just did that. So let's have a look again at what happened in memory. So here and here we have it, and we have, this is a much longer message, full stop, and then we have our null terminator, just after the full stop, okay? We're safe. <laughs> sort of. We're safe. Okay. We did a good job, and we'll keep going. And now we are going to change status. So we're going to go in change status, and yes, we passed 32. 32 is... Uh, bigger than, you know, uh, it, so it's a positive number, so that will be accepted. And so we're going to change it and our watch point is going to detect it. Obviously, that's because status before was zero. So there's a change and he's going to detect it. And obviously 32 in hexadecimal is 20. So obviously uh, he shows the value in hexadecimal, so he's going to tell us 20. Okay. And now the next time we're going to change, we're going to call change status again, but this time with a negative number. So this should be ignored. And indeed it is. So no changes this time. All right. Let's see what happens and let's print all these values. OK, so index is now two. Yay. Message is this is a different and much longer message. And then we have the message line is 44. And then status is 32. And at this point, well, we're going to print the address of them. And obviously, we know they haven't changed. So we're going to have 105 F0 for index. We're going to have F4 for message. We're going to have F8 for message line. And then we're going to have FC4 status. All right. Next, we are going to, well, leave some function. But before we do, C++ is going to call the constructor. Oh, sorry, the destructor. And the destructor, as we've seen before, is going to reset the values. And obviously, <laughs> because the memory, uh, the, the, the value, sorry, that that address has changed, the watch point will signal that to us. And then again, 
this time you see this time I also signaled for status and that's because status was 32 and we reset it back to zero so I signal that and now we are going to free that message and now we are going to set message to null and it will signal that hey we have set, we have set that memory address now back to zero all right so we're going to go back to uh now main so we're going to leave some um, some functions excuse me and then we are going to return to the operating system and that's it for this test all right i hope you have learned something more about debugging c++ uh c front so uh dd c++ with ddt on riscos if you have any comments any questions please let us know in the comment below and i will see you on the next video thank you very much for watching